Well, I think it started. There we go. Okay. So we would like to um, remind everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute and you may type questions in the chat box. We will address these during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your question then. And this uh, grand rounds should last for approximately one hour. And now our speaker, Dr. George Lole. He is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in 2020 during the pandemic. And a graduate of the University of Damascus Faculty of Medicine, he completed his residency at the University of Kentucky. He is a fellow. He did his fellowship in cardiovascular degree, disease at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga and an additional fellowship in advanced cardiovascular imaging at the University of Utah. Dr. Lole is co-director of advanced cardiovascular imaging and the medical director of the cardiovascular genetics program at Franciscan Health. Welcome, Dr. Lole. Thank you, Don. Um, I want to thank everyone today for taking the time out of their busy schedule to attend this talk. Um, Dr. Lole, oh, there, are you going to turn your camera? There you go. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. Can everyone see my presentation now? Yes, we can see it. So, um, I don't have any disclosures for our, our, our today's talk. Um, our educational uh, objectives for today is basically to understand um, the utility of calcium score. I'm just going to go briefly over that, given that there's another talk about primary uh, cardiac prevention later on by Dr. Ryan Daly. And then we'll go over the different modalities, the strengths, the weaknesses, and trade-offs of different uh, uh, cardiovascular imaging modalities. And then we'll learn how to employ each modality to answer a certain question. And then hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll know how to order a study um, similar to an advanced imager. Um, so briefly going over according calcium score, I'll just start with uh, an example. Uh, and this is very common. I'm sure you see this on a routinely and daily basis. So let's say you have a 74 year old female, active smoker, one pack per day for 12 years. She supposedly quit two weeks ago. She has hypertension that is being treated and her LDL is 150 and HDL is 38. And she's basically wondering if she's going to have a heart attack like her dad did back in the day. And so in order to be objective about your answer, one thing you can do or you should do is either download the ASCVD app on your phone or you can pull it uh, um, on your computer and then you would basically uh, plug in the patient's demographic and that would include the age, the gender, the race, the systolic diastolic blood pressure, um, the your uh, lipid panel values and then whether patients on a statin therapy, aspirin and then that will give you your 10 year risk for a major cardiovascular event. And in this lady, it was around 7%. So what do you do next? Um, if, uh, if you're not certain, you basically can um, use a calcium score. And this is a cross-sectional cut. This is an axial cut uh, through the heart. And basically you're seeing the atrium, the aorta, and the uh, 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 right ventricle here. And then we scroll through the uh, all the slices and if there's any calcium it will be calculated and we'll have a score at the end of it so this is a normal study and this is a an abnormal study and the red is basically the calcium and it's been calculated here automatically by the computer and you can see the calcium here is in the proximal lad uh the diagonal branch and in the uh mid segment of the lad itself and the nice thing about the calcium score it gives you extra information that you can look at, including atherocalcification within the ascending thoracic aorta, descending thoracic aorta, and we also measure the uh, size of the ascending thoracic aorta on those studies, and usually those are reported um, in the uh, or dictated in the final report. So not only it gives you the calcium score, but there's so much information in that study, including the size of the aorta and the presence of atherosclerosis outside of the coronary arteries as well, because that also is a risk factor. And so the calcium score uh, 
uh, how does the calcium score help? Well, if your calcium score is zero, you can see here in black that adding statin therapy in general doesn't change your long term outcome. But once you have a positive calcium score in general, you can see there is early separation uh, after a year and a half or so. But once you dive in deeper into the data, you can see that again, the calcium score of zero, there's no difference with therapy. If you have a score less than 100, there's minimal difference and it wasn't statistically significant. You but once your calcium, I'll get that to you soon. Thanks. Bye. You know, once your calcium score is over 100, then you can see significant difference in your outcome once you're addressed or treated with medical therapy. Um, and this is again showing the difference that if your score is zero, one to 100, there's not a whole lot of difference in, in your outcome if you had a statin therapy. But once your score is greater than 100, then you can, you can see a drastic difference in the, uh, the uh, overall risk of cardiovascular events over the next 10 years. And so I'm just going to go again briefly over some certain recommendations because we're going to have a, a bigger talk later on. Um, when do you do a calcium score? If you're 40 to 75 years old, your LDL is between 70 to 189, and your risk on the ASCDD calculator is between 5 to almost 20%. It is reasonable to obtain a calcium score. And then if you're younger than 40 years old, if you have strong family history or early onset of, of uh, coronary artery disease or heart attacks within the family, it's also reasonable to get a calcium score because all of that would help you further risk stratify the patient. And so the benefits of a calcium score is that it's cheap. It's $49. We call it a heart scan, um, low radi radiation. There is no contrast. Um, and keep in mind one thing, a heart scan only detects the calcified plaque, and we'll go over the difference between a calcified and an uncalcified plaque. Uh, also, other things to know about a coronary calcium score is that uh, usually uh, you don't see the non-calcified plaques, and it, it should not be used as a diagnostic tool if someone is presenting to your clinic with chest pain or dyspnea on exertion. This is a screening tool and it's used to further risk stratify the patients on whether they would benefit from uh, statin therapy or LDL lowering agents. Uh, I've, I've been asked this question uh, uh, somewhat frequently. Usually you would benefit from a, a aspirin if your calcium score is over 100. And that, at, at that point, benefit outweigh the risk. Again, it's all about shared uh, uh, decision making. And once your calcium score is over 100, usually the benefit outweigh the risk. Um, when do you repeat the calcium score? Uh, in low risk patients, uh, every five to seven years. If, if your calcium score is zero, low risk patients, every five to seven years. If they have intermediate risk, every three to five years. Uh, again, this is with a calcium score of zero. Um, once your uh, calcium score is greater than 100 and your LDL is still greater than 70, then you can repeat the calcium score in three years uh, to assess for progression. Now, I would caution you if, in general, if the patients uh, say had a calcium score greater than 100, let's say 150, they've pursued aerobic exercise, they've lost weight, uh, uh, I would not uh, repeat a calcium score because let's say the calcium score at that point is 110. That does not necessarily mean the progression of the disease. What it might mean is that the patient have done the right things and some of that non-calcified plaque or soft plaque has transformed into a calcified plaque, which is a good thing. But obviously, if it's non-compliant, hasn't followed the recommendations, then you can repeat it in, in uh, three years to assess for drastic change in calcium score. So that's calcium score, and that's basically our main tool for screening for coronary, uh, coronary artery atherosclerosis. Now, when it comes to ischemic evaluation, um, it, traditionally you would have been taught that patients would come to clinic and they would complain of exertional symptoms. But that's not always the case, especially in females. A lot of patients present with what we call atypical symptoms. And so it's all about your uh, pre-test probability. Uh, it, it, the story is not always uh, what we were taught in, in, in training or med school even. And here I'm just going over the natural progression of coronary atherosclerosis or uh, blockages. If you start from the bottom left, you can see this is a cross-sectional cut in a normal vessel. You have a healthy entoma and a wide open vessel. And then as you accumulate fat in the uh, intima itself, 
This is what shows here in orange and they keep progressing. And as you can see, the lumen size, it gets smaller and smaller. And at some point, it's small uh, to a point where you have demand and supply mismatch. And that's when the patient usually starts having symptoms. Uh, when it comes to uh, seeing that or diagnosing that, uh, as you, the first abnormality that you see is usually a perfusion defect. Uh, so a, a stress test, a nuclear stress test would be uh, the most sensitive one here. This is the traditional training. And then you would have a perfusion defect. On echo, you would see diastolic dysfunction. On a stress echo, you would see uh, systolic dysfunction. And then later, you would see ischemic changes on EKG. And obviously, eventually, patient would have chest pain. That has been the tr traditional training in this, in this series in, in which you, you diagnose the patient. And so usually, let's say, and if the, when it comes for active chest pain in the ER and your EKG is unremarkable, your echocardiogram doesn't show all motion abnormalities, with active chest pain, there's lower likelihood, but we're not being certain. And so uh, we, we've been taught that how, well, what kind of stress this? We've been taught that if you have a normal EKG and a reasonable pretest probability, then you put them on a treadmill plus minus imaging. Well, today I would like to change the way we, we, we think of uh, ischemic evaluation. There are two big pathways, either anatomical testing, and that's basically coronary CT and geography, or functional testing. That includes stress echocardiogram, SPECT MPI, which is a nuclear uh, stress test, or stress MRI. So we're either going to define if, if a patient has a blockage based on anatomy or indirectly by looking at uh, different uh, uh, markers. And so if we want to look at, if we want to do anatomical testing, which, which we're going to be more and more popular moving forward, and we're going to uh, see why. Obviously, with coronary CT and geography, you're using radiation. It's slightly uh, more expensive than an echo, but it has an outstanding negative predictive value, and we'll give you some examples. And it's pretty reasonable at this point. It's pretty, it's a pretty reliable tool when it comes to assessing uh, for ischemia or obstructive coronary atherosclerosis. Uh, it should be used in symptomatic patients. Uh, hopefully moving forward, that Franciscan will, will use it in, uh, in the ER for acute chest pain evaluation. And it's really helpful in, in younger uh, patients who presents with uh, syncope and chest pain to look for suspected anomalous coronary arteries. Um, the, the insurance approval has, been, has drastically changed. Uh, they don't fight back as much. And um, not only you assess the coronary arteries, but you can, you can also look at other etiologies for chest pain. So you can assess for massive PEs, dissection within the um, ascending or descending thoracic aorta, and non-cardiac causes. Uh, plenty of times we've had uh, patients who presented for a coronary CT and geography. Next thing you know, you have a big hiatal hernia um, causing the pain. And so, the limitations usually in obese patients, once your BMI is over 40, you would have a lot of artifact. If patients have prior coronary stents, it's not the best test. And obviously, if you have an acute coronary injury, you can't do that with contrast. And if you have contrast allergy, and then in, if you have an irregular rhythm, especially AFib, you might get some optimal images. And once you, once you're, if you have a known calcium score, usually greater at this point, greater, greater than two, probably 3,000. Coronary CT and geography is probably the, not the best test for this for a patient in general. And so here are some examples. The nice thing about coronary CT, if you start from the left, you can see the takeoff, and there's just a, a clear lumen, and there is no blockages whatsoever, and there is normal the vessel as it courses uh, down uh, on the septum itself. Here you see a calcified plaque causing positive remodeling, meaning, it, meaning it's protruding into the outside. But still, this won't. This is not. Uh, this is a blockage less than fifty percent, and the chest pain is not caused by uh, uh, this plaque in here. And then, when you come to more significant plaques, you can see that there is a, a in the middle. You see a calcified plaque here, and you're probably causing, based on our classification, somewhere between fifty to sixty-nine percent. And then, like I said, if you have a lot of calcium, it is not the best study for you because the 
the brightness is what we refer to as Bloomin artifact. You, you can't see the lumen, you can't tell what, whether this plaque is causing actual obstruction or not. And this is basically a really nice example. You can see the, a good wide open lumen at the top. As you course down, there is a plaque here not causing significant obstruction. But once you get down there, you see this dark, low attenuating plaque. And this, this plaque would rupture usually and give you a heart attack. And this is, uh, this is a plaque that we would worry about. Well, then the normal one is, is pretty reassuring. And you can tell the patient is, uh, is not have, his chest pain is not caused by coronary atherosclerosis. The one on the far right, you can tell that the chest pain is caused by a significant obstructive plaque. But what about the ones ones in the middle? How can you tell if the chest pain is caused by significant obstruction or not? So the CTA became more significant in our practice. Uh, the second CT-based FFR was approved. So what happens if we see a lesion greater than 50, causing greater than 50% stenosis? the study will automatically be sent for CT-based FFR analysis. And that will give you a hemodynamic assessment of the uh, plaque itself. So if you look at case number one, uh, this is your LED, and you can see there's a large mixed plaque, meaning there is calcium in it, and there is also an uncalcified or soft plaques. And if you look at the residual lumen, this is probably somewhere between 50 to 69%, 69% stenosis. But you can, again, visually, you cannot tell if there is a hemodynamically significant stenosis or not. If you look to your far right, the study was sent for a CTFFR analysis. And usually anything less than 0 0.8 is compatible with significant stenosis. This patient was taken to the cath lab. The same value was confirmed with a catheter-based FFR analysis, and the patient had successful intervention. This is the RCA or the right coronary artery down here, and you can see this high-risk soft black causing negative remodeling, meaning the, the uh, lumen is, uh, is more narrow, and given that the plaque is entirely soft, this is more of a high-risk plaque. But when it was sent for a CTFFR analysis, it was not hemodynamically significant. And so and that was confirmed in the early studies with the heart cast. Same thing, that there was a catheter-based FFR analysis, and this lesion should be treated medically because putting a stent there will not alleviate the symptoms. Those are actual examples from our own practice. And so to your far left, you see the LED here, um, and you can see that there is a calcified plaque in the proximal segment probably, and then there's the uh, first diagonal branch. There's probably a mixed plaque lesion. There is a mixed plaque lesion here causing 50 to 69% stenosis. This is the left circumflex. And this is the RCA. If you go back to the left circumflex, there's also a mixed plaque here. Cause, uh, and the, this plaque is not causing a hemodynamically significant stenosis. And with the RCA, you have a plaque causing minimal stenosis. And you can see here, it's pretty eccentric. And th this vessel to your far right is pretty reassuring. Now, again, going back uh, to the uh, LAD itself, I was not sure if this lesion was causing a hemodynamically significant stenosis or not. So it was sent for a CTFFR analysis. And here you can see that the LED lesion was causing hemodynamically significant stenosis and everything in red is basically uh, uh, the mid to distal LED and there is compromised perfusion there. But when you look at the RCA, it's all blue. There's no significant stenosis there. And same thing with the left circumflex. So the, both tools definitely complement each other. Um, now, what's what's nice about why do I like CT more than other modalities when it's uh, when the BMI uh, allows for that test? Well, because you can detect early disease, disease like here and over there that otherwise won't, won't show up on a stress echocardiogram, stress MRI, or even a nuclear study. And those studies, are, as a later, we would call it a normal study, and then this patient would go about doing his. Uh, uh, routine stuff, but no preventive th preventative therapy would, would have been introduced. But in this case, we can see that there is plaque here and plaque there. And even if the patient didn't have the significant plaque here, we would still get to treat him with statins and try to modify his risk factors. So that's the nice thing about coronary CT in general. Not only you get to see the obstructive disease, but you, you also get to see the early onset coronary atheros atherosclerosis. And so, uh, in, in the last quarter of 2021, uh, the ACC and AHA came with new guidelines. 
And the few things that I want you to pay attention to that at this point and moving forward, it's all about shared decision making. And number two, we should, um, the term atypical chest pain should, shouldn't be used or I wouldn't encourage to use it and we should go with either uh, cardiac or non-cardiac chest pain because at this point we have all the tools that will, will tell us with a, a high degree of confidence whether the patient is having chest pain by obstructive heart disease or non-cardiac chest pain. So even in my uh, notes at this point, I'm pretty specific. It's either uh, obstructive coronary artery disease or non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And so when it comes to assessing patients with uh, chest pain, you have usually you have two presentations, either an acute presentation to the ER or your outpatient stable presentation. So when it comes to acute presentation in patients with no known prior history, at this point, if their BMI, uh, BMI allows, so a BMI less than 40, you can go for coronary CT and geography. And if you have an intermediate, your outcomes are either normal or you have an intermediate lesion where you send that study for a CT FFR, and the turnaround time will ideally be two to three hours. And then based on their results, you either start the patient with guideline-directed medical therapy or you send them for a heart cath. Um, what about patients who uh, have known coronary artery disease? Well, if we knew from before that the patient had less than 50% stenosis, CCTAs can still be used. And again, if it's an equivocal re uh, result, we'll send it for a CT FFR analysis. And based on that uh, value, we can decide on whether this patient needs ICA, which is a heart cath, versus just guideline, medic uh, guideline directed medical therapy. But if you're not comfortable with CT or you think this patient has high disease burden, then you can still go back to your well, what I call the functional imaging. So either a stress MR, stress echo, or a stress a PET or a stress SPECT. In our practice, we don't have a PET. We're going to have it in the outpatient setting. So your options would be either a stress SPECT or a stress CMR. And so again, either acute presentation or stable presentation. And then once you get to, if you're going for down the acute presentation route, you need to figure out whether patient has prior disease or not, and then you can make a, a decision based on that. Um, well, what about stable chest pain? Same thing. If I if the patient has intermediate to high pretest probability, CCTA is now uh, strongly encouraged, but you can still do your stress CMR pet inspect. And then based on the results, so you either have normal coronaries, no disease whatsoever, non-obstructive disease, but those patients will get to uh, uh, be started on guideline medical therapy. So the aspirins, the statins, the anti-anginal therapy. Uh, and you truly uh, reduce their uh, long-term incidence of having events, or they have disease, uh, you send it for a CT FFR again, and based on the result, you, de you decide if they need further intervention or not. And so this is basically, uh, and then the last route, if they have stable chest pain with known CAD, either way you need to intensify their medical therapy and you can have either options. Again, you can, if, if, they're, uh, if you know that their disease is not that significant, you can do CT FFR or you can do with your, which is anatomical testing, or you can, the route of your functional testing. Um, so uh, why is that important? Well, because hopefully moving forward, this is a game changer because now uh, with the right hardware, those patients in the acute setting can present to the ER uh, if they have negative troponins, uh, they can uh, undergo a coronary CT and geography study, uh, the result should be reported within an hour, and if they have an intermediate lesion, it will be sent for a CT FFR. And within two hours, we would have a very objective answer. You either have no disease whatsoever, or you have some disease that we're going to treat you uh, uh, with medical therapy, or you have a significant disease that warrants an intervention. And the turnaround time would be six hours. And so you'll be reducing the the downstream testing that we usually do at this point. And if you think about it, even if you do a, uh, right now what we do is a, a stress spec. So we do those studies and and you're not sure even if the study comes back at, as what we report normal, uh, you're not sure if this patient had, still have uh, early onset coronary atherosclerosis that will get them in trouble later on. And so personally speaking, even based on the guidelines, anatomical testing and the right patient criteria is is the way to go, but you need the proper hardware for it. And so 
that was CT or anatomical testing. Well, what about functional testing? Obviously, uh, nuclear stress to respect myocardial perfusion imaging has been around for a long time. Here, uh, this slide is basically showing you different cameras out there, and I think we have two different. We have a DSPECT in our outpatient center, and we have a diff uh, another one in the inpatient center for uh, uh, ER ischemic evaluation. You, you get to use either um, SystemEB, CardioLite, or MyView, and we use the latter, MyView, in our practice. Um, and this is basically what we're looking at. So we're indirectly assessing for It looks like um, we've lost Dr. Lole's sound. I will text him and let him know. Um, I've lost everything, Don. The screen is completely frozen. I can't, nothing's moving on my end. I'll, I'll ask him to dial back in. I just texted him, so hopefully he'll get that message. And he's probably talking and doesn't realize it. <laughs> oh, he got my message. I think I might tell him to have his uh, video turned off and then uh, maybe that'll help save some bandwidth for him. Thank you everyone for your patience. Well, hopefully he will get himself back on the call. Sorry, there I was we go. myself for probably <laughs> minutes. <laughs> we don't know how much you. We don't know how much more you were talking before you <laughs> realized you weren't there. Let me go back. Uh, but we were on, I think, slide thirty-four or no thirty. We know you were on thirty-six. Slide thirty-six, talking about the um, the views. And um, I wonder if maybe if you turn off your video to see if that oh, might help save some bandwidth and then um, you can keep talking. Um, there we go. Did you guys lose me during the, those? No, you were you were on slide 36 where you were showing the images of the nuclear stuff there. Yeah, you were there or the next one. Sorry about that. And so basically, again, here we're looking at a normal study. You see the stress on top. And the um, uh, rest at the bottom. Now this is a short axis. This is uh, a, a vertical long, and uh, and uh, this is a different illustration here. And basically, you see homogeneous tracer uptake. You don't see any perfusion defects. And both images look compatible and very similar. And so th there's no discrepancy. And this is a normal study. Again, keep in mind, I, the, the only thing I can tell this patient is you don't have a big plaque. 
uh, that is causing the chest pain, but I can't tell I can't tell this patient whether he has early disease or not. Um, here, this is a, an abnormal example, and you can see that there's decrease in the count in the anterior wall at stress rest. And you can see that it extends from the apex all the way, almost all the way to the base. And you can see that also in different illustrations. So in your vertical and horizontal long, you can see that there's thinning and decrease count in the uh, anterior wall and um, on those two illustrations. And given that this is basically compatible with ischemia. So at rest, you have normal perfusion, but with stress, your perfusion goes down. Uh, this is the polar map, and it, it also gives us a semi-quantitative way of looking at uh, the degree of ischemia, and this is a normal example. And so this, if you have a perfusion defect at stress in this area, this is usually the LAD, the left circumflex, the RCA. Um, and you, this software will basically tell us how much ischemia or how much myocardium is involved. And usually if you're greater than 5%, this, is, this tends to be a significant burden of ischemia, and those patients should be uh, treated aggressively with medical therapy and potentially with a, a possible coronary intervention. And here, this is another tool with the uh, uh, quantitative perfusion. This is the uh, bull's eye, and you basically segment the heart into 17 segments. And so with stress, this zero is normal, five is a significant defect, same thing with rest, zero is normal, and it goes all the way up to five. So a five is a, is a, a significant defect. And again, just to be clear about the difference between ischemia and infarction, if you see a perfusion defect in, at rest and stress, this is an infarction. This is dead tissue and there's nothing to do about that. The patient had a heart attack at some point. But if you, you see a perfusion defect at stress, at uh, rest, there is no perfusion defect. This is ischemia, and that's basically uh, the one that we need to treat medically and potentially with a, a plus minus an intervention. Um, and so limitations um, given if, and so that's where your pretest probability again plays an important role. So uh, there's a, you always run the risk of having balanced ischemia. So when you have uh, three vessel disease, you might have almost normal perfusion and it has to do with with the fact that the perfusion the blood flow through all vessels has decreased and the computer might read that as a normal study and so keep that in mind and then there's the false negatives again in, in, in smaller hearts and in obese patients and with large breasts um so what do you do for those cases hopefully starting q uh, q3 or q4 of this year a PET would uh, answer those limitations. So once your BMI is greater than 35, if, if you're obese, if you have a large breast as a female, a PET study would be the best suitable study for you. And we'll go through examples and we'll explain why. But again, the take home message from a nuclear stress test is that you're indirectly assessing for ischemia causing the chest pain. And brief stress echo, this has been around for, for a while, again, see the anatomy what you're looking for as you exercise those patients or when you give them a pharmacological stress test or the butamine you're looking for increase in the contractility so let's say a normal heart would squeeze 55 to 60 percent of the blood you'd see an increase in that squeeze and robust uh, thickening of the heart uh, the heart tissue or the heart walls and obviously if your function declines at peak exercise or if you notice wall motion abnormalities that is indirectly telling you that there is a a blockage that is causing the, the chest pain and that should be addressed with uh, a medical therapy and possible intervention. Again, we're indirectly looking at uh, for ischemia. This is a functional test. Uh, and obviously it's an ultrasound, so you cannot tell you cannot tell whether this patient has zero calcium, some disease, or a lot of disease. And it might be sometimes you might have what we call poor acoustic windows. So the ultrasound waves, let's say in obese patients, might not travel through the soft tissue. So we use the contrast and that will enhance, enhance our ability to uh, uh, visualize the myocardium so we can look for thickening and function. Um, obviously, it is not the best study in obesity or patients with severe COPD. And that has to do with the fact that those lungs are very expanded. And uh, uh, the ultrasound wave 
will uh, uh, fade as it travels in, in, in air mediums, basically. And if you know that this uh, certain patient already has a heart attack in the past, well, it's not the ideal test because they will have wall motion abnormalities to start with. And so PET, uh, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year, we'll have uh, our outpatient PET scanner up and running. It's an awesome test. Uh, it has great accuracy, superior efficiency compared to SPECT, lower radiation exposure compared to SPECT. Uh, and then you have more added information. You get your calcium score. You get your myocardial flow reserve and you get your accurate EF. Uh, and, we'll, and I'll explain why all that is important. When it comes to the. Uh, when it comes to the uh, basic concept, you still get the perfusion images you get with a SPECT, right? So you see your rest images at the bottom, your stress images at the top, and then you compare. And you can see that there's thinning and decrease in the count in the infralateral area starting from the apex and extending all the way to the mid to prox segment. And given that there's discrepancy be between those two images, so normal at rest, abnormal at stress, this is ischemia, and this patient has obstructive coronary artery disease. But, and this, this was basically confirmed. Uh, you can see this is a, a coronary geography, and this patient has uh, an occluded obtuse marginal branch, compatible with, with the uh, description we saw here. Um, I'll jump back to PET, but uh, let's go briefly over stress MRI. Similar, so what we're looking for is, is uh, stress. So uh, we give contrast, and then the contrast will opacify the cavity, uh, and then we give the patient a stressor similar to uh, a PET or a SPECT, and then we look for a perfusion defect, subendocardial perfusion defect. And basically, once we see that discrepancy between the rest images and the stress images, we can tell that there is ischemia and keep in mind ischemia always starts from the endocardium and it makes its way up to the epicardium and this was basically confirmed with a coronary angiography that demonstrated obstructive disease in the in the rca but again you, you cannot with whether it's pet or mri <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. OK, sorry. And so other than CT, you cannot tell if, if a patient has uh, a coronary atherosclerosis, but it's a great tool that like PET in patients with bigger BMI, uh, COPD, it is very sensitive. Um, now, also, why cardiac MRI? Well, it's the gold standard when it comes to assessing the function, the LV mass. It is a great tool to assess the RV function. On echocardiogram, we can estimate what the size and the function is, and then we can define other anatomy when we can assess the, the vessels. And so, again, uh, it's great for uh, to assess the myocardial mass. We can look at the pericardium. We'll show some examples. It can gives us information on dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and if you have inflammation or not. Um, now, what PET and MRI, um, they're better than a SPEC because they can also give you information at the time of the stress regarding micro, mi microvascular disease. And I think that's this is one of the things that we should increase awareness to. So when we think of coronary artery disease, traditionally we think of the epi epicardial vessels, so you're the big vessels that you can see with a heart cath. But you should also start thinking of the microvasculature, the vessels, the microvessels that you can't see even with a, with a heart catheterization. And so PET and MRI can assess that, can assess the function in, in this microvasculature. And so this is basically a an illustration of a coronary vessel and obviously it starts with a big epicardial vessel and tapers down to the arterioles and then the capillaries and so sometimes uh, and especially in females unfortunately we they present with typical symptoms uh pain with exertion it goes away with rest we do a heart catheterization and there is not significant disease there and a few years ago in a lot of centers we would say well it's not your heart 
it's anxiety or, or inflammation. And then those patients were unfortunately go about, uh, leave our, uh, the practice without being addressed. And so I just want to introduce here what we call the ischemic non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And so, and, I, and I'll show examples, but to start with concepts, um, you can assess for microvascular dysfunction with stress uh, CMR and stress PET. At the same time, you're doing your uh, the traditional study. And so basically, if you look at the two uh, bottom, uh, in the middle and the bottom right, if you have no ischemia, but decrease uh, a reduction in your, what we call the MBFR, your myocardial blood flow reserve, then you have microvascular dysfunction. Uh, And here, if you or you have ischemia and microvascular dysfunction, and it's a really cool tool, uh, piece of information to have. But why is that important? Because this study was published in 2018, and you can see in patients down here who have non-obstructive coronary artery disease, if they have microvascular disease, they still have high incidence of major events long term. So we need to target this population and make sure it gets uh, diagnosed, treated, and addressed. And that's why it's important. And this is basically an example of how you assess for that. It's the same thing here. Uh, this is the bullseye. At stress, you see this huge dropout. This is all perfusion defect. At rest, you have a small defect. Obviously, this is ischemia. And when you look at your myocardial flow reserve, the, the global is decreased, the LAD is decreased, the left circumflex and the RCA. But ironically, if you look at the image here, you can see that the LAD territory uh, is perfusing. But this patient, based on the uh, myocardial flow reserve, I can tell with a high degree of certainty that this patient has three vessel disease. And so when he was scat, he had a 100% occluded RCA, 100% occluded left circumflex, and 80% stenosis on an uh, in an LED, and we were confident to the point where we even loaded this patient with Plavix before his heart catheterization, knowing that he's going to be referred to cabbage, and he was. And so uh, that's ischemia. And then I'll go briefly. I know we're running out of time. Um, the non-ischemic evaluation. And so this is an this is an actual patient that was seen in our practice. And so he was 60 years old. Uh, he had. Uh, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He had urinary incontinence. Um, he had a rectal exam and was found to have a rectal mass. And then he was eventually found to have uh, cancer uh, of uh, poorly differentiated cancer. And he was uh, initiated on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, eight cycles of full FOX, followed by concurrent chemo radiation with 5-FU, and then surgery. Uh, Interestingly enough, after five cycles of Folfax, he developed some uh, mid-back pain. It wasn't bad enough. Uh, he also reported some shortness of breath and chest tightness, tightness at that time, but it, it, it was not addressed. Um, he later had a CT chest as part of the workup and an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram itself showed decline in the function and a suspicious mass in the LV cavity. So the next test for us was to do a cardiac MRI because cardiac MRI will give, gives you a lot of information when it comes to tissue characterization. So this is basically a two chamber long axis in this gentleman, the actual patient. And with a certain uh, acquisitions, you can see usually black is good and white is scar. That's the tissue. And you can see that this patient, when he had the chest pain, he basically had a uh, myocardial infarction or heart attack. And so all of that tissue is dead. And you can see there's no viable tissue in this area over here and over there. And then you can see this dark mass. And based on its tissue characterization, we can, in this acquisition here, it's still dark. We can tell with a high degree of certainty that this is an LV thrombus. And so MRI told me that this patient had a heart attack caused by his chemotherapy, and he actually has a thrombus with a high degree of certainty. We have not put a single catheter in this patient yet. And now the next step was to figure out if uh, the gentleman had an actual myocardial event. And given that the tissue is dead, uh, we elected to go with a coronary CT because there's no, uh, there's no need for an intervention, right? 
So this was his, uh, this is the RCA, and you can see it's clean. There is no disease. The narrowing here has to do with the curve multiplanar, but there's no disease whatsoever in his RCA. You look at his left circumflex, you see this tiny ditzel, the plaque up there, but that definitely didn't cause a heart attack. But once you go to his LED, this is basically a dissection. The, guy, the gentleman had dissection. What you're looking at in a multi uh, uh, cur curve reformat is the, uh, the flap. And so he dissected all the way from the proximal segment, from the proximal segment all the way down to the mid segment. And so and that was confirmed with, with a coronary angiography, basically. And we did that just because we, we've never seen those cases reported. But what, what excites me about this case that the workup and the diagnosis did not involve a single catheter. And so uh, one of the, another take home message is that sometimes those tests complement each other. MRI is really good at tissue characterization. If you have a mass, MRI is the way to go. And then if you're looking for ischemia or just anatomy in general, CT can give you the answer. Uh, brief examples just to apply what we just talked about. This is a 38 year old male, diabetic, left bundle branch block, and with stage three kidney disease, hypertension. He's presenting with chest pain. What would be the next uh, test for him? Is it an exercise echo? Uh, PET spec, cardiac catheterization, cardiac CTA, or an exercise uh, spec. Um, I'll break them down for you. Not an exercise echocardiogram because he has a left bundle branch block, so the EKG itself won't be helpful, and you'll have wall motion abnormalities to start with from the left bundle branch block. A vasodilator stress test is the test I would go with. At this point, you should not send a patient for a heart catheterization unless you have objective evidence of ischemia. Coronary CT, um, I would avoid it given that he has uh, chronic kidney disease, um, and so you don't want to expose him to contrast. And then exercise uh, spec, same thing, the gentleman has a left bundle branch block. Um, another gentleman, 40 years old, uh, no strong family history, BMI of 43, presenting with chest pain may may not be related to exertion. Uh, in this gentleman, would, would you do an exercise stress echo, a heart catheterization, cardiac CT, myo view, or a 2D, two-day farm spec? Given that he's obese, you either do a two-day two pharmacological stress, and hopefully starting next year or later this year, we'll just do a PET scan. The guy is obese, um, his BMI is 43, and so doing a one day uh, nuclear stress study is just won't give you the answer. Cardiac CT, given that his BMI again is massive, um, won't give you the answer either. And again, I wouldn't send anyone for a heart catheterization unless you have objective evidence of ischemia. Um, and so this is a 40, uh, 42 year old female diabetic active smoker presented with pleuritic chest pain. Um, same modalities in this case, I would either go, I would go with a cardiac CT given that her BMI is normal, but you can also consider an exercise echocardiogram. Um, and do I, Don, do I have more time or should I stop? I have more examples. You still have about 10 minutes, so oh. um, yeah, there'll be time for you to finish and then see if there's some questions. And there is a question in the chat already. Okay, and then uh, this is another gentleman, diabetic, LVAH on EKG. He has AFib, he's on deltaism and DIGH, and he has asthma and COPD. How would you assess for ischemia in this gentleman? Uh, exercise echo, CAT, CT, nuclear stress test, uh, adenosine or regadenosine. And in this gentleman, um, you would go with regadenosine, uh, hopefully pet in the future, but you can do SPECT right now. Um, you cannot do uh, CT in this gentleman because he has a fib, and so you will have a certain motion artifact. Um, and then adenosine will give him, uh, with active wheezing, that will make his wheezing worse. So things to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, this is the 19-year-old college, has family history of sudden cardiac death. Um, uh, and he had um, an exercise EKG that demonstrated two millimeter ST segment depression at peak exercise. Well, in, those, uh, in this population, uh, the things to keep in mind, the red flags is the family history of sudden cardiac death. 
And obviously when he exercised, he had horizontal two, two millimeter ST segment de depression. So the two things you need to keep in mind in a young, in a young patient with family history, family history of sudden cardiac death and this presentation, or even the presentation of syncope is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and anomalous uh, origin of the coronary arteries. And so if you, in this case, a cardiac CT would be the best test because not only, obviously he doesn't have coronary atherosclerosis, but it'll give you a good uh, idea of the origins of the coronary arteries. And it also can give you an idea of the wall thickness of the myocardium and whether this patient has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or not. And that would be the end of my slide. But I guess the take home message in general, when it comes to testing for ischemia, you have anatomical testing and you have functional testing. And depending on what your uh, risk factors are, patient information is you can decide. Remember that with anatomical testing, you, could, you get to screen for early onset disease. With functional testing, you don't. Uh, PET and MRI has the ability to uh, assess for microvascular disease. So if, if you have a 40-year-old late uh, diabetes and traditional risk factors and it, it, uh, non-obstructive disease on cath, I would consider PET and or, or MRI to assess for microvascular dysfunction. And then finally, MRI has the uh, tissue characterization capability. So if you're suspicious of a cardiac mass, then MRI is the way to go. So Dr. Lole, there is one question in the chat for you. Um, from Andra Myers it says, yeah. what, is the, what is the turnaround time on reading for a CCTA? Who is reading the images and could this be utilized at night in the emergency department? Excellent question. So at this point, uh, we are using our CCTAs 80% uh, uh, of the time for outpatient stable chest pain. We have used it for um, ER patients in the uh, lower to intermediate risk population. And we basically haven't been more aggressive with ED evaluation because uh, we lack the, at the main campus, we lack the hardware support. So the thing to keep in mind when it comes to coronary CT is that you're imaging the only organ in the body that moves. It moves in, in two ways, systole and diastole, and it moves back and forth. So if you think of, uh, of a camera if, uh, and you're taking a picture of a moving subject, the, the image will be blurry unless that subject slows down. And so currently the current hardware we have does not support, uh, does not support us or can't carry us through that mission. So we tend to do that in, a, in low risk patients. The turnaround time um, for, pay, so that ultimately once we replace our scanners, the vision would be if someone comes overnight at seven or 8 p.m., they would have the scan first thing in the morning and it would be read by noon and it would be admitted under OBS and he would have an answer at that time. Um, the read itself doesn't take more than 15 minutes because we have a, a, a robust and a phenomenal 3D post-processing lab. And then this, if the patient has an intermediate lesion, the CTFFR time for ER, in general, the turnaround has, you can actually change the priority of the study. So if you want to, you can come back in as short as 30 minutes. So, but up to two hours would be a fair assessment. But ultimately, hopefully we would have a chest pain unit. Patients would be in and out 12 hours. Uh, with, with an objective answer on where, where the chest pain is coming from. And, and again, we should just uh, try to uh, avoid the, the, the term atypical. At, at this point, with the current tools that we have, uh, we can tell a patient, our patients with certainty what's causing their chest pain, with, whether it's obstructive heart disease, inflammation, or non-cardiac chest pain. Is there anyone else who might have a question if you want to come off mute and ask a question? I have a question for you, Dr. Lole. Um, for primary care providers, do are, are primary care providers, <clears throat> excuse me, ordering cardiac CT and cardiac MR, or is that something that just a cardiologist orders? Uh, it honestly depends on, so if, it depends on what you're looking for. If uh, you're addressing chest pain, um, hopefully, ultimately, we should be able to uh, uh, streamline 
the ordering process for them so that those patients don't have to uh, uh, be see seen by us in order to get that study uh, ordered. But at this point, based on my exposure uh, here, the, it's easy for them to order a stress echo or a, nu a nuclear stress test. It's uh, they don't have the infrastructure to get the coronary CT ordered right away. I might be wrong, but I have not and I haven't seen a study ordered by a, a non cardiologist so far. But that will be one of our uh, goals for next year once we uh, have the uh, infrastructure that we need to standardize that therapy, uh, that uh, workup. Is there is there anyone else? Is that your dog in your background, Dr. Lole? Uh, yeah, those are mine. <laughs> your dog's excited. He they had are. a question. <laughs> well, if anyone um, else on this uh, mess on this team's meeting has a question for Dr. Lole, feel free to you can send it in the chat after this meeting is over and I can definitely get we can get it to him and get a response to you. But I um, want to thank everyone for participating in this uh, Grand Rounds uh, presentation tonight. And don't forget to complete the evaluation so that you can get your CME. The link is in the chat for those who are on Franciscan um, email. And if you're not, we just need to reach out to Amy Bova or myself to um, get the link sent to you to your email so that you can complete it. So that's um, that's all we have for this evening. Thank you all for attending. Have a good evening. Thanks, John. Nice job. Thank you, Dr. Lole. Excellent yeah. presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Lole. I will stop the recording. <laughs>